we were created as communal beings, as familial beings, to give of ourselves, to actually sacrifice, to have some kind of commitment. And I just hope there are women who can wake up and realize, you know, I, I'm not enough. I don't have it all in myself to make sure that I'm fulfilled and satisfied. I actually have to give of myself in order to do that. Hey, hey, and welcome. This is the Ben Shapiro Show Sunday special with our special guest, Ali Stuckey. We're going to get to questions for the conservative millennial and the host of Relatable over at Blaze TV in just a second. But first, can you believe that it's already April? Time has a habit of getting away. But if you've got a mortgage or kids or anyone depending on your income, you're going to have to spend some of that precious time getting life insurance. If you need life insurance, but you don't want to spend a lot of time comparing it, you should give Policy Genius a try. Policy Genius is the easy way to buy life insurance online. In just two minutes, you can compare quotes from the top insurers and find your best price. Once you apply, the Policy Genius team will handle all the paperwork and red tape. No commissions, no hidden fees, just more time saved for you. And Policy Genius doesn't just make life insurance easy, they also make it easy to find the right home insurance, auto insurance, or disability insurance. They're your one-stop shop for financial protection. So, if you need life insurance but you're short on time, head on over to policygenius.com and compare quotes. Policy Genius is easy, it saves you money, not to belabor the point, but it's fast. Policy Genius spend less time comparing life insurance, more time doing literally anything else. Be a responsible adult, make sure that your family is taken care of in case, God forbid, you should plot. Make sure that you do the responsible thing. Go get some life insurance right now over at policygenius.com. Once more, that is policygenius.com where you can compare life insurance and save yourself some time and money. Well, Ali, thanks so much for joining the show. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I think that this makes you the fourth woman we've ever had on the show out of yes. some 40 guests. So we're and doing great. First, and the first pregnant woman. Right, so this is the first time I've interviewed two people at once. Yeah, I know. So we'll see how she does. Yeah, exactly. Well, if she keeps her mouth shut, it'll be fine. Okay. Right. I, I think, think she can I think do it'll that, be okay. okay, so when are you due? I'm due in June, the end of June. So got a little bit of time. And obviously you already know the sex of the baby. Yes, it's a girl. Although we can't actually judge its gender, correct? One of two choices, just a girl, yeah. Okay, but I don't want to be cisgender, so we don't, I don't want to assume the sex of the baby, even if you know I the sex of the baby. I think it's probably going to be safe to assume. I'm just going to go ahead and put that on her. Okay. She's a girl. Okay. Yeah, well, not going to give her that option. Good to know. So yeah. how are you feeling? I mean, this is first baby, so how are you yes. feeling about all this? Are you in the impatient phase yet? Just get uh, it out phase yet? Kind of. I mean, you remember, I'm sure, your wife was pregnant twice. Once you get in the third trimester where I am now, you're just like, okay, I'm huge. I'm uncomfortable. I'm so ready to be done with this. I'm not even quite there yet. I'm only 28 weeks. And so it's when you get into that like 35 and beyond that you're like, I am done being pregnant. But it's good. I, obviously, it's a blessing and I'm I'm enjoying it. I mean, the good reason. news is that it's not a baby yet, right? I mean, like it's not. A, we've been told that it's not a baby until it's like five. It's just, I think it's just like this club. It's so weird because I actually feel her moving around, but I'm trying to reconcile that with the idea that she's just this blob of tissues. It's it's crazy how that happens, though. <laughs> so you're the host of a show called Relatable. For folks who yes. haven't seen it, go check it out over at Blaze TV. And yes. you've been in the headlines a lot over the last couple of years, particularly for having a thing called the sense of humor, which I believe the left has near made illegal at this point. Yes, they've completely killed it. And well, one of your most famous non-humorous bits, it was not satire, I was informed. It was just fake videos, bad editing was you making fun of Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. Yes, which was really easy to do because all we had to do was take things that she actually said and ask her questions and make her answer them to show, hey, this lady doesn't actually know very much. And so we didn't even have to satirize it all that much. We didn't have to you know, take her words out of context that much. We just kind of showed, hey, this is who she is and what she believes, and it worked. I mean, I was, I was pretty amazed by the media reaction to that because it, it is astonishing to me how they suddenly forget what a sense of humor is. Yeah. They forget what a joke is. Like suddenly, it's, yeah. the, the jokes don't exist. You're, you're perfectly serious, and you deliberately cut her out of context to make her look bad. Yeah. Not as a joke, just because you're a vicious person, Ellie. Yeah, it was dishonest, and I think that we all knew that. I love the, the sanctimony, too, of them saying, well, we know that it's satire, but there were a lot of people online that just didn't know it, so we need to explain this to you, that this interview that was spliced together from a PBS interview that you saw last week, that it's not real. I mean, it couldn't have been more obvious that it was a joke. I was surprised by that. I knew people wouldn't like it, but I was surprised a little bit by people pretending not to know that it was spliced together in a humorous way. Yeah, that, I was I was shocked by that too, especially because this has been a typical thing that's been done right. on Comedy I did Central not invent it. forever. I mean, exactly. Stephen Colbert does it on his show regularly with President Trump, where he pretends that he's interviewing Trump yeah. and then he cuts it out of place. It really is astonishing. So 
you, you gained a lot of notoriety based on that. What's, what's life been like since the rise of, of your notoriety in the last couple of years? I mean, why don't we start from the beginning? How okay. did you get to the point where yeah. you do what you do now? Yeah, so it was about three and a half years ago. So fall of 2015, I was in PR and social media. I just graduated from college. 2014, I lived in Athens, Georgia, which is a college town. It's where the University of Georgia is. And uh, I was extremely interested in this election, probably not for the first time in general. I wasn't interested in politics for the first time in general, but this election seemed um, extremely important in that our nation was at a tipping point, especially for young people. And I was surrounded by these college students and surrounded by other people my age who knew a lot and were well-educated, but had no idea what were going, what was going on in the primaries, no idea who they were going to vote for, if they were going to vote at all. And I just kind of looked around and thought, okay, this is, a, this is a problem. I've got all these smart people around me and they have no idea what their values are. And so I just kind of randomly uh, had an idea and called my mom one day in the fall of 2015 and said, I think that I want to go to sororities and tell them why they should vote in the primaries. I just think that's something that I would like to do. And so I started reaching out to the presidents of these sororities at the University of Georgia saying, hey, I've got a nonpartisan presentation. It was nonpartisan about why you should vote in the primaries. I want to do it for free. I, I just want to tell you guys why this is important. And so I started doing that. And then I started getting a bunch of emails from students saying, hey, can you answer my question about this? And I just I loved it. I kind of fell in love with that idea of helping people form their beliefs. And then I kind of ditched the nonpartisan thing pretty quickly, started the blog, The Conservative Millennial. Uh, after a few months of doing that and just writing posts and then doing videos, that kind of took off at the end of 2016. The beginning of 2017, we moved to Texas. That's when I got a job at The Blaze. And that's when it kind of became a full-on career. So it was about a year and a half of you know speaking for free writing for free doing my own thing until i got hired somewhere and then it turned into a media career that i was actually doing um and i still do all of that i mean i have a podcast now because i worked at crtv which is now blaze tv I have a podcast i still speak on college campuses and of course i'm on tv commentating so i do a lot of the same things that i did in the very beginning it's just now uh, I do it full time. So you have a couple of strikes against you in sort of being in the conservative category. You are young and you are female, which means yeah. that you can neither be young nor female if you are conservative. So how did you end up as a young female conservative? What shaped your values? Yeah, um, well, my parents, definitely. I don't have an interesting uh, political story in that I don't have any kind of like about face at, at, at at which point I said, okay, I once believed that or I once thought that and I don't anymore and here's what's changed my mind. I kind of wish I had that story. I think it's interesting when people do. I just don't. My parents uh, were poor growing up. They really came from nothing and they were poor when they got married at 19 and 20 and they made really good choices in their lives to make sure that my brothers and me had a better life than they did. And when I was young, they talked to me a lot about entrepreneurship. They talked to me a lot about uh, the joy of being your own boss and being able to be independent. They always told me, you can do whatever you wanna do. Whatever dream you have, if you put your mind to it, you can do it. And so they never talked to me about politics per se. I mean, I knew that we were Republicans. I knew that we liked George W. Bush. I remember all that. But they never sat me down and said, you know, here's why we're conservative or here's why we're Republicans. It was really just the values of individual liberty, of entrepreneurship that I liked. And I never had a moment where I was like, you know what? More government control actually sounds kind of good. Or like maybe maybe I don't feel like human beings have this great potential that they can reach on their own. I never had that. And so it was really the values that my parents uh, instilled in me growing up. And of course, being raised in a Christian home, I think has a lot to do with that as well. And so I, I really can say I've always been a conservative, but probably didn't really understand why and what that meant until I was in college. And how did you define yourself as a conservative in college? You say you sort of made yourself aware of what your actual principles were. What were the, the sort of key components of your self-education? Uh, well, I think that my faith has always kind of undergirded everything that I believe politically. And I think that starts with the dignity of the human being. That's why I believe in the Constitution. That's why I believe in how our country was founded. And I think uh, being those things being pushed against in college is what made me realize, wow, not everyone believes the things I do. Because I grew up in the Bible Belt in Dallas, and I went to a Christian school, kindergarten through 12th grade. Then I went to college in South Carolina, which is not a, you know, not a very liberal state, but went to a liberal arts college where a 
lot of the professors probably leaned to the left and took a lot of religion classes, a lot of uh, rhetoric classes, and a lot of uh, constitutional law classes. And I realized, okay, what I believe about the Constitution, what I believe about individual liberty and small government is not something that everyone believes. But I was lucky. I don't know if it was just because I, I went to a good school that I really, that had a lot of good professors, or if it was just before all the craziness happened. But I had an amazing professor who was a liberal. She taught African American rhetoric, which was one of my favorite classes. And she loved Barack Obama and she knew I was voting for Mitt Romney. But we had a lot of conversations in her office about the differences that we had, that she was a Christian, I was a Christian, she was pro-choice, I was pro-life. And we could sit down and have conversations. I was one of her favorite students. She still talks to me. She was one of my favorite professors. I never felt ostracized in her class. I never felt really in any of my classes, maybe I was just ignorant, but I never felt like oh, I can't believe this, or I can't talk about this. I always felt like there was an environment in which I could discuss and debate these things. Um, and I would say that Dr. King, while I was in school, really helped kind of helped me hone what I really believed. It was the pushing against and the debating that helped me, I think, uh, make it my own. You know, when I was in law school, I had a professor named Lonnie Guinier, who was the undersecretary, uh, nominee for undersecretary of labor under Bill Clinton. So far left, she was so, so Marxist, the Democratic Senate turned her down. And she was very much the same way, very open-minded, happy to have conversations like this. I feel like something has changed for a broad spectrum of folks on the left where they don't actually want to have conversations anymore. They would prefer to browbeat or attack character. Do you feel like there's been a sea change in how the left approaches these discussions? Probably. I think it's very identitarian in nature and that if you disagree with me, it's not just that you're wrong, but it's that you're a bad person. And it's also because you hate me for who I am. We can't separate ideas from people or from the from the people who hold them. And so I think that's probably part of the vitriol. Um, I can't say exactly why that happened besides the eight years of identity politics that were exacerbated by Barack Obama and used by Barack Obama. Um, and so there definitely has been a shift in that, but I, I didn't bear the brunt of it when I was in college and that I'm really thankful for. So w with all of this said, you know, do you think that there is a, a common center for the country right now. I mean, th this is what I worry about most. So, you know, you talked about the fact that these discussions take place and, and some people on the left would have these discussions with you and you talk about the rise of identity politics. One of the things I fear is that the social fabric is decaying to the point where we can't have the discussions at all. You, you speak to young people all the time. Do you think yeah. this is getting worse or is this getting, is there a place where it comes back together? I think some of the depiction of college students is can be a little bit overblown. And I obviously, you know this better than anyone. There are a lot of college students out there that do not want debate, do not want dialogue. They don't want discussion. They don't want to hear your ideas. They just want to call you a racist. But I have had a lot of interaction with students who are on the left or in the middle who really do want dialogue. And I, I do think that we need to point that out, that not every leftist student uh, believes that you are a racist idiot for being a conservative. They might not agree with you, but I've had a a lot of respectful students uh, come to my talks and ask me very respectful questions. Now, they might not like them. I've had definitely a few here and there that will yell during my talks. The most disrespectful uh, students I've ever interacted with were at UC Berkeley. The absolute worst couldn't get any words out without someone screaming. It was crazy. It was like they never heard a conservative thought. But I would say in most places I've been, there are people on the other side who are willing to hear you out. I wish we would highlight that more. And then I also wish uh, that we would use those voices and, and, and give platform to those kind of conversations because they do happen. Okay, so let's talk about 2016. You started to rise to prominence in 2015, 2016. You started getting really involved openly politically. What was your stance on, on President Trump during the yeah. election? I was adamantly against him in the primaries. I think I probably have a position that a lot of people did. Adamantly against him in the primaries. I had family members that voted for him in the primaries. I was like, I do not understand what you guys see in him. I mean, he doesn't stand for anything that I believe in, not personally or politically, or it doesn't seem like it anyway. Especially from a Christian perspective, I'm like, this guy is just spouting his mouth and I'm just embarrassed every time he talks. How could someone vote for him? But then he became to me the lesser of two evils. I'm like, okay, what, what, what do I want? Do I want someone whose personality and personal life I really hate? Or do I want Hillary Clinton who's, and I saw it as a binary choice. I know that you didn't and a lot of people didn't, but I did. Or do I want Hillary Clinton who I feel like is going to perpetuate some of the worst eight years um, in the history of American presidencies that we've just had? And so I said, you know what? I don't know. I don't know if Trump is going to lead conservatively, but I trust that he's 
probably at least more likely to surround himself by people who support the values that I support and that will push for the things uh, that I believe in more than Hillary Clinton will. And so that's why I ended up uh, voting for him. And I would vote for him again, if not only to save country from what have become extremely radical Democrats, not even practical Democrats, but radical Democrats. And I think a lot of people probably feel the same way. So can you assess President Trump on, on sort of his own terms? Let's put aside the Democrats for a second. You have to grade him. So yeah. why, why don't you give him a grade for, for how, how he's done so far? Hmm. I'm going to give him a B plus because I think policy wise, he's done, he's done some good things. I mean, he's done some good things. I probably more than a lot of conservatives that support what he does, I actually am bothered by his rhetoric. Like, I'm truly bothered by it. Like, I really don't like his personality. I don't like how he is on Twitter. I think a lot of people, they've come to love that maybe, or they've come to just not care about it, but it really just rubs me the wrong way. So I can't give him an A. And of course, the pro-life issue, yes, he's been an advocate. He's been outspoken. His administration has. Um, but we're still funding Planned Parenthood, and that should have been a top priority, in my opinion. Um, so I would probably give him a B plus. I do wish he would just be quiet. Now, a lot of people love that. Like I said, they love that about him and they think that I'm crazy for thinking that. But I just I really hate how he throws punches. I think it's extremely petty and immature and I don't like it. OK, so let's talk about exactly what you're talking about. I think that one of the great problems for President Trump going forward to 2020 is the fact that in 2018, he really lost suburban women. Suburban women split really in a strong way against him. Uh, he's doing really poorly among young people. And as I say, among females particularly, he's winning among males. He's losing dramatically among females. Do you think that that is something that holds going forward? Do you see any any hope that he's going to be able to compete against a Democrat uh, among among women, given all of his personality issues? Yeah, I, I think it, it largely depends on, and I hate to continue to grade Trump against Democrats, but they make it almost impossible. It's like, yeah, Trump alone isn't, all that great. But compared to the barbarism that we're seeing in some portions of the left, yeah, he seems pretty he seems pretty great. And so I, I think it depends on whether or not women are going to be swayed by that, whether or not they're going to be swayed by his policies, whether or not they're going to be swayed by his actions, or if they're just going to be swayed by the emotional rhetoric that he's throwing kids in cages, that he grabs women by the genitalia and reads his Twitter feed and sees, okay, this is not someone that I would want my kids to look up to. This is what I think a lot of suburban moms are thinking. And so why, why would I vote for someone like this? And I also think that there is this attachment to social justice, uh, particularly among white evangelical women, suburban moms that says, okay, yes, I used to vote Republican because I was pro-life. I cared about abortion, but now maybe pro-life doesn't just mean abortion. Now maybe pro-life means kids at the border. Now maybe it also means gun legislation. Now maybe also it means the redistribution of wealth to help the poor. So you've got this expansion of pro-life happening, coming from the left that's seeping in to the evangelical female world that I think could push people away from Trump. But then again, you got Democrats calling for literal infanticide, so that could turn some off too. So if you look at the Democratic fields, who do you think is the most dangerous to President Trump right now? Uh, I've said Kamala Harris for a while. Now, she hasn't, I haven't really seen her in the headlines all that much recently, just because she has the intersectionality point. And even though she, maybe her background isn't necessarily what uh, most leftists would like, I do think because she carries herself in such a mature way, because she carries herself as so even keeled and as a good and strong leader, and she does have the intersectionality points, uh, I think that she could possibly be a strong contender. But if we look at the numbers. I mean, we've got Bernie Sanders, we've got Biden. Um, I think someone like Pete Buttigieg, I don't think that he's necessarily going to be a strong contender, but someone who says that, hey, I represent real Christian values. I represent what it really means to be a strong leader. I'm also a veteran. I think people like that make Trump kind of look petty and um, they, they could definitely have an effect. But Ultimately, I, I just don't know if it's possible for him to lose at this point. I don't know. Um, so I want to ask you about Buttigieg for a second, because in the last couple of weeks, he's made some comments specifically yeah. about Christianity that yeah. I, as a religious person, found pretty off-putting. His yeah. suggestion, number one, that if, if, if you're evangelical and you support Trump, then you're obviously not evangelical. Yeah. Uh, and then his suggestion also about Mike Pence, that Mike Pence was 
arguing with God if he thought that Pete Buttigieg yeah. was engaged in sin. I found both those comments peculiar and yeah. off-putting, but how prevalent are, are feelings like that in the evangelical community, do you think? Well, it just kind of it just kind of depends. If, if, in between, if you have evangelical Protestants, I think 69% of them still support President Trump, Trump and the job he's doing. That's down, but that's still a lot of them. But only about 50% of mainline Protestants, and I would include Buttigieg in that. Those are people that typ typically have a more liberal doctrine and liberal theology. Those people, about half of them approve of Trump. So I would say among the mainline Protestants, that's probably... Uh, a pretty prevalent line of thinking that, okay, Trump, he doesn't represent who Christ was. He doesn't represent a peacemaker. He doesn't represent someone who turns the other cheek when they malign him. And that's what Christ told us to do. And so why would an evangelical vote for him? But something I would say to Pete Buttigieg is, well, look what your party represents and then tell me who you think the evangelicals would really vote for. Yes, as we've already discussed, Trump's uh, personality and some of the things that he says, they're not attractive to most Christians, I would say. No one looks at him and says, that man's a lot like Jesus, but they look at him defending religious liberty, defending the unborn and all of the things that we hold dear. And they say, okay, well, that's probably better than socialism. Like that's probably better than infanticide. Um, so Buttigieg seems to not understand that. As far as the whole Mike Pence thing, uh, I mean, obviously, obviously, that is, it's not a, it's just not a correct statement. You can disagree with Pence's theology on gay marriage, but it's not correct to say that Pence would be arguing with God because the Bible is extremely clear. We both agree on this, but in the Old Testament and in the New Testament about gay marriage and about suppressing biological urges in order to honor God uh, and, and to do what he says to do, whether we agree with it or not. And so, that, again, was a very theologically misguided statement. You might not agree with Mike Pence, but to say that he's arguing with God is a little bit silly. And it was that exchange that really led me to believe that, that there are a lot of people on the left who are just upset with religion generally, meaning that it's not that they think that, that Trump is a bad representative of Christianity. It's that anybody who is on the right is a bad representative of yeah. anything. And the attacks on Pence, I think it's just a reminder to a lot of folks on the right exactly why Trump is president, meaning yeah. that they did this to Romney, they did this to John McCain, now they're doing it to Mike Pence. If it were any Republican, they'd be out there suggesting that person was a bad Christian, even somebody like Mike Pence who really tries to live his faith out. Yeah, they're really only okay with the Christians who who believe the parts of the Bible that talk about helping the poor. And only if you wanna help the poor in their way, only if you want the government to actually help the poor. So they're okay with Pete Buttigieg saying, I think he said his favorite Bible verse was whatever you do for the least of these you do unto me, which is true. That's a great Bible verse and that's what Jesus said, but he's that's an individual mandate. That's an individual command. That's not a command for the government. Of course, we already know that, but uh, that's what the left says, that you're not really compassionate. You don't really uphold the biblical values of compassion unless you believe in government control. And of course, most conservatives, if not all conservatives, know that's not true. Okay, so other candidates on the Democratic side of the aisle having some trouble to launch, Joe Biden most prominently. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you make of the controversy surrounding Biden and his odd hair smelling and yeah. face touching and all the rest of this? Here's my thing. I don't think that he is a sexual assaulter. I don't think he's a sexual harasser, but I also don't think that his actions are completely innocent. I don't think that he's just this old guy from a previous generation that likes to smell of shampoo. I just don't believe that. I think that there is a little bit of creepiness and a little bit of weirdness. And I would say a purposeful weirdness that comes with him being overly touchy to women in public. I just think it's odd. I, I know that you can be a touchy person, but at some point your social cues kind of pick up and say, okay, well maybe I shouldn't smell the back of someone's head. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so I don't think it's completely innocent. I do think that he's creepy. That doesn't mean that he is a villain of the Me Too movement though. And you know, that, that does raise the opposite question that the left has raised, which is anytime you say that somebody like Joe Biden is creepy, well, what about President Trump? How do you deal with that? You know, as, as a female conservative, how do you deal with Trump's history, the allegations yeah. that have been made against him? How do you bifurcate? Well, what I encourage people to do, if you were against something that President Trump did, just say that. Don't try to make an excuse for it. I could say, yeah, I don't like what he said in that Access Hollywood tape, and I don't like what he's probably done with women. I don't like that he probably cheated on his wives. That doesn't make what Biden did any better. If your only argument for someone's morality on the left is but Trump, that's not a very good argument. Why not be the person that says, 
yeah, both of them are wrong. I'm not saying that Trump is disqualified because of those things. I'm also not saying that Biden is disqualified because of those things. I think people should make that decision. But I, I don't think the but Trump argument is a very logical one. So where do you think we stand with the Me Too movement, given all of this? So there, there's been this attempt to expand the Me Too movement beyond sexual assault yeah. and sexual abuse to weird hair smelling. Uh, and at the same time to suggest that an allegation is tantamount to proof of guilt. Yeah. So where do you think, do you, do you think that the, what started off as what I thought was actually somewhat of a positive yeah. movement uh, is is now irredeemable? Do you think that there is some core of it that is that is left to, to be promoted? Yeah. What do you think of its trajectory? I agree with you that in the beginning, I thought that it did some good and that it gave women cover who maybe previously were scared to talk about their stories uh, to come forward and say, yeah, this happened to me and it was wrong and it scared me. Whatever they wanted to say, I do think it's good that women feel more confident in coming forward that they're not only going to get shamed for it. Um, but it turned very quickly and it was mostly during the Kavanaugh thing from listen to her to believe her. I'm all for listening to her. I want to hear her story and I think that she deserves to be listened to. I don't think she deserves necessarily to be believed no matter what. And so that's when, when it shifted from believe her to, or to listen to her to believe her, that's kind of when we lost all sense of logic, all sense of justice, all sense of truth. And I'm not sure if there's any way to go back. And what, what do you think the, the sort of gradations of Me Too look like? Because this is the other thing that's happened, is that there's two big questions I see outstanding. One is the question of evidence. So you have Brett Kavanaugh, somebody makes an allegation. A bunch of people jump to, he's automatically guilty. A bunch of people jump to, there's no evidence, he's innocent. That's question number one. Then question number two is, what is the kind of activity about which we should be worried? Because the Me Too movement seems yeah. to me never to have actually clarified this. On the one yeah. hand, there's Harvey Weinstein activity, which you can everyone can sort of can see is disgusting. And then you have people who are like, well, Aziz Ansari, the comedian, invited a woman back to his apartment. They engaged in a bunch of consensual stuff. She decided later she wasn't happy with it. Yeah, that's me too. too. Well, where do you think the the lines should actually lie here? Yeah, I certainly don't want to be the one to set the concrete standard, but I do think Aziz Ansari is a really good example of when it wasn't when you made a, a decision to do something and then you didn't like the consequences of it, which is totally fair. You can tell your story, but you you can't say that you were assaulted. And we do need to draw the line there. And I think something that we need to get better at is uh, not calling encouragement of personal responsibility victim shaming. Like there is wisdom that women should have. Should guys uh, be too forward with girls after they've told them no? No. Should guy, Do guys ever have an excuse to do something wrong to a girl, to assault a girl, to harass a girl? Absolutely not. But are there steps that girls can take? Is there provision that girls can take? Is there wisdom that girls can employ? Absolutely. And I think um, that the conflation of offering wisdom and guidance to women, advice to women on personal responsibility with victim shaming has just made the whole conversation so stupid. Like you can't even, you can't talk about it. You can't talk about it at all. You feel like you can't even tell your daughter, hey, here are some steps that you should take to just be wise in your life and to avoid bad guys because bad guys are always going to exist. You feel like you can't talk about that because simultaneously you see, I mean, half of Instagram has their entire butt out the entire time. And you're saying, well, I don't want to be objectified. Well, you're going to be objectified. You're going to. I'm not saying that it's right, but you're going to. And so, but we're not allowed to talk about modesty. We're not allowed to talk about any of that without them saying, well, you must, you know, hate women, be a misogynist and um, blame all victims. Well, well this, this is true. definitely a pet peeve of mine. And it's something that you can speak to more obviously because you're a woman. Uh, you know, where does the line lie between as you say, victim shaming and personal responsibility taking. Because if you ever have, you know, I have said on the show, don't get drunk and go back with a guy back to his room. Yeah. Like, just don't do it. It's a stupid thing to do. Yeah. And then people say, well, this is you making an excuse for a guy. It's like, well, no, that's not me making an excuse for a guy. That's me saying that if you walk through a high crime neighborhood waving your wallet around, you get robbed. That's the fault of the person who robs you, but you're also an idiot. Yeah. Like, don't put yourself in a risky situation. Why do you think it is that so many people find simple factotums that, that people give every day to their children to suddenly be a form of victim shaming. Because I think the highest value that our culture now has is authenticity, which means doing what you want to do. That's the only value we have. It's not discipline. It's not honoring God. There's no sense of shame anymore. And so if your only goal in life is to just be yourself and do what you want and be happy, then the idea of suppressing any kind of desire that you have seems really cruel. It's not just discipline. It's not just wisdom. Well, that's that's 
almost archaic. That's really mean. I, I don't want to do something that I don't want to do or I want to be able to do something that I do want to do. And so the idea of kind of suppressing any urge that we have is really unattractive in a world in which we're told that you shouldn't have any guilt, shouldn't have any shame. You should never feel bad about yourself. We're told self-love is the most important thing that you can have. If you just wake up in the morning and tell yourself how awesome you are, then you'll be completely fine. And so discipline and the idea of making good choices at the expense of what you want doesn't really fit into uh, the idea of just making yourself feel good all the time. And that, that system, I, I think you're exactly right, obviously. And I think that system leads to a, a tremendous amount of, of actual unhappiness. People who are at war yeah. with reality and who think, okay, well, I'll just ignore reality. And then if things don't work out the way I want, then I've been somehow destroyed by the system. With all of that said, let's talk a little bit about dating advice for young women. So I have dating advice for young women, which is typically watch out for guys. Guys are the worst. They're like, so bad. Guys are terrible. Yeah. There, was a, there was a girl when I was at Harvard Law who had a the, the name of a book she wanted to write that I don't think she ever did, but that seemed about correct to me, which was boys are scum, girls are dumb. Uh, and I thought that's a fair synopsis, and at least insofar as guys go. Girls are dumb yeah. about guys. They think that guys are, are generally well-intentioned and nice, and guys are generally not well-intentioned and nice. Yeah. And guys are gross and take advantage of girls all the time, but girls refuse to accept this and thus make silly decisions about guys. What is your dating advice for, for young women? Yeah, well, it's, it's all different now that I know that I have a daughter coming into the world because it, my dating advice for myself was that I'll learn from my own mistakes. I mean, I dated stupid guys both in high school and college. I did learn from my mistakes and I ended up marrying an awesome person who was nothing like the people that I dated before who were so stupid. But now that I have a daughter coming into the world, I'm like, I really don't want you to learn from your own mistakes. I'd rather you learn from my mistakes or other people's mistakes. I wish that I wish that no one would date in high school just because you're just so dumb, you're so hormonal, you have no idea what you're doing, you have no idea what the idea or anything, you have no idea what a good idea is, you really don't. And so wait until your brain fully develops, at least until you're like 21 or 22 and you can make some semblance of a good decision. I wish people would go down that road, but date someone that shares the same values as you and that you could actually see yourself marrying. If you couldn't see yourself marrying the person, don't give them something that you ultimately wish that you would have only given to the person that you end up marrying. Well, obviously that's archaic advice. I mean, telling people to be virgins until marriage is, is right. obviously very scary stuff. Right. Speaking as a person who did it, it works out well. It's great, guys. But yeah. it's, it, but... You never regret it. You never regret getting married. You never get married and say, wow, I wish I would have made out with more guys. Like, I wish I would have woken up next to more strangers in college. No one says that. But a lot of people say, I really wish I hadn't given so much before I got married. So, seems like good advice. And what's your advice for, for guys, conversely? Like, what, what should a guy be looking for in a girl? And what's, what's a good dating strategy for, for women? What's a good dating strategy for women? For men, men with regard to. Okay, well, I would say the same thing. Look for someone who shares your values. Look for someone who is respectful. Look for someone uh, who you could actually see yourself ending up with. A lot of guys I've noticed are attracted to the crazy. There's just something about the crazy that guys like. I don't know if it's the dependency or what it is. No, that's gonna be miserable real fast. She might be really cute. She might make you feel like you're needed and wanted like you're a superhero. That gets old real fast. Look for a girl that can hold her own, can have a real conversation with you. It doesn't matter if she wants a career or not, but just someone who thinks, uh, who knows who she is, who is confident in who she is, and um, who can actually challenge you to be a better person. Do you think that the institution of marriage is gonna make a comeback? Because obviously it's had a pretty rough few decades here. First, with enormous number of people having kids out of wedlock, but also just people being in relationships a lot less. I mean, the rise of the pornography culture, the rise of an online culture that suggests you don't need human companionship, people ignoring relationships in favor of other things. And there was a, there, it's been fascinating to watch the left panic over the yeah. so-called sex gap, young people not having as much sex when they were guaranteed to have as much free, fun, consequence-free yeah. sex as they could possibly want. And now they're just not having sex. They're just staying home and watching Netflix yeah. in the absence of relationships. Do you think marriage is going to make a comeback in here? I hope so. I've also hoped, I've hoped for a resurgence of a lot of things with millennials being so degenerate, with going so far to the left, with being so irreligious, with being so obsessed with technology. You do wonder if there will be an awakening, either the younger millennials or the next generation of saying, okay, like this isn't going well because our depression rates are high, our anxiety rates are high, we're really lonely. And so maybe the things that we're pursuing and the things that we're doing, this hyper individualism that we're so addicted to, this instant gratification that we're so addicted to, maybe it's not 
working out so well. Maybe there's a purpose bigger than myself. Maybe happiness is found in giving of myself rather than just giving to myself. There could be that. I certainly hope so. I can't say I'm necessarily optimistic, but I, I do wonder with all of the science that's coming out about how harmful technology is. Not that I think technology is the source of all evil, but with how harmful it is, especially to children, if there will kind of be a turning away from the hyper-individualism that I think is encouraged by technology and a turning into family, to community, to things that are happening in real life. And I think if that happens, then there could be a change in values. So one of the things I think that feminism has done, particularly to young women, is basically lied to them and yeah. said that they could, have a, they could have everything. And it's just not true. I mean, in my opinion, it is, it is pretty, in fact, not even opinion-based. It, the science suggests that you cannot have all of these things. There are only a certain number of hours in the day, and yet people have been told, young women have been told, you should pursue career first. You should not have kids until you are almost out of childbearing yeah. age. You shouldn't get married until you're 30. You should you should wait as late as possible for everything because you must develop a career because true fulfillment is to be fa found in a career. Yeah. I don't think that that is ultimately fulfilling for for a huge number of women. What's your what's your take on all of this? I don't think so either. And I think it goes back to again that very popular mantra that you are enough, self love. Self-care, it's very thinly veiled narcissism that you are going to find everything you need inside yourself. And so chase that career, get good triceps, make sure that you follow this eating plan, wash your face, clean out your closet until it sparks joy. All of these things that might not be bad independently, but when you look to these self-help guides for all of your satisfaction and fulfillment, you very quickly realize that you don't have enough in you in order to make you satisfied and fulfilled long-term. You just don't. We were created as communal beings, as familial beings, to give of ourselves, to actually sacrifice, to have some kind of commitment. And I do think that unfortunately kids are seen as this kind of accessory that it, they're a burden to uh, the rest of your life. And so they're an inconvenience if you want to travel. You need to make sure that you travel all the countries in Europe, we hear, before you have kids. You need to make sure that you make a certain amount of money. Well, that sees kids and family as a huge inconvenience to your life rather than what the Bible says that they are, which is an amazing blessing and a privilege. Um, so I think it's just a, a shift in perspective. And I just hope there are women who can wake up and realize you know, I, I'm not enough. I don't have it all in myself to make sure that I'm fulfilled and satisfied. I actually have to give of myself in order to do that. Okay, so now I have to ask you the first question where we will disagree. So okay. apparently you're a big fan of leggings. I do, I do. I love leggings. Have you ever worn them? If I bet if you wore them, no, you would I'm like them dude, too, Why would I ben? possibly wear leggings? I'm just saying, you might change your mind. No, I'm a married heterosexual man. I don't uh, wear I, leggings. I don't know. Okay. I mean, okay. has your husband ever wore leggings? Not, no. <laughs> right, of course, you have, of course he hasn't. He's, he's a married heterosexual arguing, man. Like, he's not arguing with me about the leggings, though. Of course, I wouldn't argue with my wife about her wearing leggings either. Okay. Okay, and so this what's, is my argument what's, against okay, leggings. what's your beef? What's your beef? Let's okay, hear it. So here, okay, so we'll start from a premise. Different clothing conveys different things to people, right? Okay. This is why we don't wear, walk around naked. The closer a woman is to walking <laughs> around naked... Leggings the closer, are not close to that at all. You are such a girl. It, like, they're pants. Gonna, they are pants that are that are skin tight. That is the purpose of leggings. Yes. Okay. I mean, okay. Am I wrong about this? Like, there are sweatpants. Sweatpants are baggy they, and but comfortable. They, but they, I wear sweatpants. Show, I know, but you can't go on a walk in sweatpants. It's too hot. They are literally called sweatpants. You sweat in them. That is what they are no, for. You, you go for a run in that. sweatpants. And, and you don't know. You look more put together if you have leggings on than if you have sweatpants on. So if you're going to the grocery store, you want to be comfortable. And not everyone likes how they look in shorts, but leggings, nice leggings can make you look a lot so better admit, than I, you actually do. I, I know that's true, but, um, but, the, but okay, so, so it's I'm not going to ask how, I mean, I've, I've never worn leggings, I've never worn a skirt, so I have no idea what the relative <laughs> comfort of these clothing items is. Are leggings significantly more comfortable than skirts? Well, you don't want to wear a skirt to the grocery store going on a walk. You want, it's what? called athleisure. So it's <laughs> athletic, so you can go from working out to the grocery store. I used to teach bar, and so that's really all that I wore is leggings. So it's very hard for me to see them as inappropriate, although I will say I get the argument. Of course, my Christian friends, my brothers in Christ have told me, you know what? This is inappropriate. It's immodest. But okay. Let would you me, let, okay, let when me, your daughter is 16, are you going to let her go to school in leggings? No, I'm not letting her leave the house. So that's not <laughs> even a question. Well, okay, my question is there are ways to make leggings 
more uh, more modest. So what if you had like a longer shirt or something? That's different. That's different? Yeah. I okay. mean, like stuff that clings to the calves is inherently stuff is... <laughs> different than, than stuff that clings to okay, other parts of the I body. Okay, then I think yeah. that's what a lot of people would say. Obviously, wearing a tube top and leggings is a totally different ballgame. Which is, game, I think, but... where the, that's the part of the story that's totally overlooked, is that the woman who originally wrote the... The reason this has come up is because there's this woman who wrote a letter to the editor at Notre Dame, this. and she wrote this letter about these girls who wore leggings and, and tank tops to mass yeah. on a Sunday, and she said that was inappropriate. And then people at Notre Dame went crazy. How could you tell young girls not to wear leggings to church on a Sunday? Yeah. And because that's that's imposing your value system yeah. on these girls. And I just thought to myself, wait a second. I went, you know, I went to a private Jewish day school where we had separate girls and boys schools, which by the way, highly recommended. Very good idea because yeah. girls actually statistically underperform when they are in high school classes with boys. They purposefully underperform because they think mm. that guys are attracted to girls who underperform statistically. Yeah. So there's that. And we all had school uniforms, and that was a very good thing to have school uniforms because there is a competitive, a competitiveness to dress, particularly among girls, that does not exist when there are school uniforms. Now, this is not a case that across the broad spectrum of society that everyone has to wear a uniform or anything like that. But it does seem to me that there's been a generalized acceptance of dressing down to the point where yeah, immodesty is is basically seen as something n not only normal but praiseworthy. Like you're more courageous, the, l the yeah. less modest you are. Yeah. The, the less modest you are publicly. And this applies to guys too, by the way. Like when I see guys running around on the street in just shorts and no shirt, and I'm like, just put on a shirt, dude. Yeah. Like, what, what is this? Yeah. And girls, I mean, basically do the same thing as well. And now I do think that there are settings in which certain clothes are appropriate and settings in which certain clothes are inappropriate. I would say church is an inappropriate place to wear leggings because they're too casual. But to the grocery store, when you got two kids in tow and you don't want to wear shorts or a skirt, as you would suggest, uh, then I think I like how you are... look at me with scorn when you when you a skirt I as mean, you any would girl suggest. girl listening to this is like a skirt. What? No, I. But I understand. I understand your concerns. Um, and I'll think about this. And girl, and this listen, over. you can wear whatever you want. But it, this this one again falls under the the matrix of reality, which is if it, the, you can you I can wear whatever it. you want. I got it. It's fine. It's a free country. Wear whatever you want. I'm not saying that you can't. I'm not saying if a guy does something bad or stares you at the wrong way that that is that that is acceptable in but any way. But you're saying it's immodest. But I, I'm saying it is less modest on an objective standard than yeah. the vast majority of clothing that women can wear shorts? publicly. Because you can see the whole leg. I mean, it depends on the, the length of the shorts. So you're good with Bermuda shorts and skirts. Got it. Well, I mean, <laughs> no, no, jeans are fine. Like, okay. they, 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 I mean, I don't, listen, again, wear whatever you want, but they, but on the, on the on the on the hierarchy no, of I what totally conveys understand. messages. They, but this is the part of the, the debate that I find so like you're you're making an argument that is based on comfort. But the part the, yeah, but the debate I that I actually saw publicly was not about that. The debate I saw publicly was I can wear whatever I want, and it's not my fault how guys look at me. Yeah. And I just thought like, well, true and not true. Like, true that guys are not relieved of responsibility in how they ogle women. Also not true in that how you dress obviously has an impact on how people yeah. look at you. I mean, if that were not the case, then policemen would not wear uniforms and doctors would not wear white coats. Yeah, and I totally agree with you. So maybe there is a little bit of hypocrisy on my side because I agree with that. I totally agree with that. And I agree with modesty and I agree with personal responsibility. We just talked about it. But I just really love leggings. But I'll think about it. <laughs> I'll, I'll think about this. I'll mull this over. I got a lot of leggings to get rid of. That's like half my clothes. I mean, I, your husband's not on this show. How, is, your, is your husband thumbs up or thumbs down on the leggings? He's thumbs up on the leggings. For her or for just generally? Just for her. Exactly. That's right. Other women, thumbs up or thumb down? Thumbs down. Correct. <laughs> Right. Okay. <laughs> also, he knows the that right was, answer. You're in the room, answer. right? I mean, that's, I that, 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 that is that is the really that is the correct answer. answer. He gives a different answer. He's in trouble. Yes. We don't want that. So yeah. Everything everything else is, is fine. Okay. So with with all of that said, let's move back to more serious politics. Who do you think okay. is the front runner for the Democratic nomination? You mentioned Kamala Harris. Do you think that yeah. she's the front runner at this point? Oh no, I don't think she's the front runner. I think probably Bernie Sanders. Right? Isn't that where the numbers yep. are right now? Bernie Sanders. I don't think that Beto has a chance. I thought that he might be a stronger contender when he first announced. Uh, I just don't think he. He has enough specificity in uh, his platform. I think that, I mean, I guess I think Bernie Sanders, I also didn't think that he was going to be a strong contender because, uh, because he has these ideas that are now promulgated by other people who are more intersectional than he is. And so why would he still, why would he still have so much sway? But apparently he does. He's the OG, the OG socialist. <laughs> so. I, I, my, so my theory is that he is going to run the, the Trump 2016 campaign, that effectively he's got somewhere between 25 and 30% of the vote. Everybody attacks Biden, goes after the Jeb Bush in the race. 
that he just sits there 25 to 30%, everybody else splits the rest of the vote. He wins the first couple of primaries at 25 and 30, that starts ticking up to 35 and 40, and suddenly he's sweeping through California, New York, and Massachusetts, which is where most yeah. of the delegates are. I think yeah. right now, legitimately, he's, he's gotta be the favorite, which is kind of frightening. What do you think it says about the country that an octogenarian socialist who used to root openly for the Soviet Union yeah. and thought that bread lines were good because at the end of them was bread, what yeah. do you think it says about the country that this person <laughs> is the front runner? Well, I think it means that millennials, which are almost the largest voting block, I don't think they will be. I think baby boomers still eclipse them a little bit. But um, I think it means that millennials have more sway and more of a voice. And that's where millennials are. That's where the numbers That's where the numbers show us going, that we are okay with socialism. We're warm to socialism. Uh, we are completely fine with the idea of Bernie Sanders and the idea of even a president AOC one day. And... Um, I think it speaks a lot to how little we know about history and how little we actually know about economics, but also that we just want we just want someone who we see as an anti-Trump. And in some ways, Bernie is simply because he's anti-American, anti what makes America great, anti-capitalism, anti all of the things that policy wise Trump has stood for. And so I think people are down for that, but also they still want to be a little bit comfortable. So they got to pick the white male. Let's, let's talk about how we reach out to young people. So okay. obviously you are the conservative millennial, which means that you have a unique capacity to draw the youths. So yes. what, what, is it, what is the way that, that conservatives should look to appealing to young people? The way, the way that I see older people thinking that younger people should appeal to is completely fruitless to me. And they, yeah. they're constantly saying things like, why don't you just talk to 18 year olds about social security and solvency? And I think, great idea. Yeah, we love that. Fantastic. There's nothing 18 year olds want to talk about That's more than when they're 65 and ready for retirement. Yeah, yeah. And, 2100. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I started out as the conservative millennial and then I kind of moved away from that only because like when I first had the name, the conservative millennial, it seemed like much more of a paradox than it is now. There's been a lot of voices. Obviously you existed far beyond when I started, but there've been a lot of voices that have picked up steam and have gained a lot of traction over the past few years. Um, that being a conservative millennial now I feel like is not as crazy as it used to be. Even you, even though you were famous far before 2015, in the past few years, like your star has risen so much to where everyone knows, okay, at least one conservative millennial exists. And so I kind of moved away from that and moved more into just talking about the things that I really believe in, which is not just politics, not just Donald Trump, but really how faith affects uh, what you think about politics and uh, what you think about culture. And finding that intersection has been not only fun, but also rewarding because what I've realized is that a lot of young people really want to know truth and they're really interested in the meaning of life. They're really interested in purpose and they just don't know what it is. They're kind of just uh, you know, just writing on these waves of life, trying to figure it all out. But what I found is that they're actually really curious to know why they should believe a certain thing. I don't think they're given that great of an answer on the left for why they should believe those things. How does that attach to a particular value or a set of principles? And I think on the right, we have an opportunity to say, okay, here's why we believe what we believe. Here's the value system that this connects to, particularly for like Christian women, because Christian women can be swayed by the emotionalism of the left but to say, okay, well, here's why I'm a conservative and here's where actually in the Bible I find the foundation for these kind of principles. Uh, there's a space there. And I think it's open for people like you and me to speak into and people are hungry for that. So when you talk about theology, where do you tend to start? Do you tend to start with the Bible? Do you tend to start with faith-based arguments? Do you use rationality to get to the faith-based arguments? Where does that conversation begin? I don't have to do that. I don't, with, with my podcast, I don't have to start necessarily with rationality and back up from there. It depends. If I'm talking about a news story or I'm talking about a culture story, of course, I talk uh, through the facts and, and what is actually going on. And then you can kind of back up and uh, give a theological basis for why you're seeing this issue a particular way. But I have one podcast dedicated every week to theology. And those, I assume that the people listening to me are Christians. And what I found is that they are. Those are definitely my most popular podcasts where I only talk about a biblical issue or maybe how it relates to the culture or how a cultural issue is relating to the Bible. And what I found, again, is that there's just not a lot of particularly women who talk about the Bible in a way that says, this is real, this is true, this is the standard to which we're supposed to live up to. It's more uh, romantic, feel good, Jesus is here to tell you that you look really pretty kind of stuff. And I think that there are women who are 
thirsty for real truth and real knowledge. And so all I have to do is support my theological views with the Bible. You don't have to go outside of that. It's self-affirming. So what are your core theological views? I mean, when, what, what branch of Christianity do you belong to? And what are the kind of core beliefs yes. of that? So I am what you would call a reformed Protestant. And I, within that, I am a Calvinist. And so Calvinist, has, uh, it's called TULIP, it's total depravity, uh, unconditional election, limited atonement. Um, oh gosh, what's I? P is perseverance of the saints. Oh, and I is irresistible grace. And so basically what that means, it's a very a contentious view in some ways, especially to my Catholic friends, that we that God chose who he is going to save in Christ before the foundation of the world, where we get that is Romans 9 and other texts, that you are predestined by God to be saved and you live out your faith um, once you are chosen, basically. This idea of irresistible grace, that you didn't actually do it. I think I heard Matt Walsh say uh, that, you know, faith is like a bridge and you actually have to walk over it. Well, a Calvinist wouldn't say that. A Calvinist would say that, well, no, Jesus came down, picked you up, cleaned you off, and walked you over to the other side to God. So there is no, I earned it myself. I mean, Ephesians 2 talks about that. Uh, a lot, that it's not our own doing, it is by grace. And so that's where I land, Protestant, Calvinist, and there's a lot of young people that have really kind of joined that movement since probably 2008. So how does so, personal responsibility and free will fit into that view? Yeah, it's, well, the same thing with Jesus said, a tree will be known by its fruit. And I mean, the Bible is filled with directives. The New Testament is filled with directives. The epistles by Paul are filled with directives, things that we are supposed to do. We are supposed to align our lives with Christ because of our salvation. Uh, Ephesians 2 says that we were dead in our sins, but we were saved by grace. It's not your own doing so that no man can boast. And so I think that's pretty clear that it wasn't our own doing for salvation, but because we were saved by Christ, uh, we kind of live up to to that salvation through something called sanctification, which is the pursuit of holiness and the pursuit of a righteous life, which does include all the things that, a lot of the things that you believe in, which not the cleansing laws, but uh, a lot of the moral laws, which is giving to the poor and helping your community and living a life that uh, mirrors Christ. So are you choosing to do that? Or is that just something that you were already going to do and you're basically kind of just living it out? So there is a balance that I think a lot of people get confused on when you hear Calvinist and you hear preordained, you think, oh, well, you don't believe in any free will at all. And that's not true. Now, I will say there is what kind of seems like a conundrum or a conflict between personal responsibility and the absolute sovereignty of God. So we believe that God is absolutely sovereign over everything. There is no point whatsoever where he sits back and he he just lets things happen or says, oh, whoops, like I didn't see that coming. We believe in the absolute sovereignty of God over everything. And yet the Bible is very clear that people have personal responsibility and that the Christians believe if you don't accept Christ, which accept is kind of a word that we don't really use in Calvinism, but that there is punishment. There's eternal punishment from that. There, for that. There's eternal separation from God. And so you are held to the consequences of your sin, to the consequences of the life that you live. And yet God is sovereign over all of that. So how do you, how do you square that circle? You square that circle with Romans 9 that says that, that asks that very question. And so the Romans were asking that question, okay, well, how can God find fault? If he destines people to hell, if he says that you are gonna be separated from me forever, why would God create anyone like that, knowing that they're gonna spend eternity uh, without him? And Paul answers that with another question. He says, well, the clay say to the potter, why did you make me this way? God is going to harden whom he wills and he will have mercy on whom he wills the same way that he uh, hardened, the same way that he hardened Pharaoh. That is God's will. He is sovereign. And who are we to ask uh, God whether or not he is just? God does the things that he does that are higher than our ways and higher than our thoughts. And that's something that I don't think any Calvinist pretends to understand or anyone or anyone who reads Romans 9 pretends to understand why would God create what Romans 9 calls vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy? And the answer really is for his own glory. So how do you, how do you create buy-in to the systems of theology you're preaching? I mean, you say that you, in, in this particular podcast that you do, you assume that people are coming because they already have a certain level yeah. of buy-in, but are you attempting to kind of speak to those people and then deepen their knowledge, or are you attempting to kind of broaden out the siphon from what you're drawing folks? What I want people to do is to rely on the supremacy and the authority of scripture rather than your feelings. So we hear a lot of culturally Christian messages that are really popular, the whole you are enough thing, or if you do this, God is going to bless 
you. God wants you to be happy. He wants you to live uh, this successful life and chase after all of your dreams. So I'll take a, a cultural lie that we're hearing and I'll say, well, okay, this is coming from a Christian teacher, but here's what the Bible says. And if you're a Christian teacher who doesn't believe in the supremacy of scripture, why are you a Christian teacher? Just be uh, you know, just be a, a self-help guy, just be a motivational speaker. But if we're Christians, then we need to hold to the supremacy of scripture because that's the only God-inspired word that we have. And so why would we succumb to any other authority, especially a secular th authority? So a lot of young people just, they don't know how to weigh the popular culturally Christian messages against what the Bible says. And so that's what I try to do. Just say, well, here's what the Bible says. Okay, so how do you, what laws of interpretive reason do you use when applying the biblical text? So I'm sure you get the question a lot that the Bible doesn't openly forbid slavery, for example. So what, what laws of interpretation do you use? So in Judaism, we have this long oral tradition, constant reinterpretation of the biblical text with a, an attempt to good faith adhere to the, the fundamental bases of the text. What you're talking about, how does it shade not into fundamentalism to the point where no reason can be applied at all, or there can't be yeah. any, how, how would you separate out the slavery question, for example? Yeah, so a really good question that I've heard, or a really good statement that I've heard is that when you're reading the Bible as a Christian, you don't ask, what does this mean to you, but what does this mean? period. And so that means you do look at the cultural context. That does mean that you do look at what kind of literary device is being used. Obviously, hyperbole is sometimes used. Obviously, metaphor is sometimes used. But it's important to know when that is and when that's not. And when we are supposed to take things literally and when we're supposed to take things as hyperbole. Like there is an open conversation about uh, the creation account and whether that was a literal 24, uh, 24 hour day for six days of creation or whether it wasn't. Um, there are conversations with Within that, as long as we say that the biblical text is our supreme authority, not tradition, not church leaders, uh, not our own ideas or our own feelings or what cultural culture says is cool right now, but what the scripture actually says, you can look at it in the original Hebrew and the original Greek. You can look at the historical context, and that's kind of the the reason, the interpretive reason that you have to that you have to use to decide. Okay, what does this text actually mean? Not does it, what does it mean to me, or what do I want it to mean, but what does it actually mean, given given the context and given the original language? Okay, so how do you bring people who aren't necessarily interested in the text into the moral fold? So how do you make the argument to a secular person that what you're talking about right now is relevant to their lives or or useful? Well, if I were to do that, I don't do that very often because what I found is that people who listen to my podcast and the messages that I've got from people who say, wow, I didn't think this way before, but I do. I've, I've never really had to make that kind of argument from a secular perspective and then go into the Bible. I do think that's important to do. That's not particularly what I do on my podcast. But of course, you can start from this place of morality, that everyone has this sense of morality, the sense of right and wrong, that no one is a true moral relativist, that no one believes in relative truth. Uh, people who say that there's no absolute truth know that absolutely. So that is a whole conundrum. So you could start there and say, okay, well, if you acknowledge that there is a right and wrong, that, for example, Hitler was an evil person and that it's not just culturally relative, um, then you have to ask yourself, well, where does that come from? Where does truth come from? It's the whole uh, it's the whole argument that C.S. Lewis makes in mere Christianity about the moral lawgiver. If you believe in some kind of moral law, then you have to ask yourself, where does it come from? It can't come from the government. That's made by men. It has to come from at least some kind of transcendent uh, force or transcendent source. And so you could always go there. So what is the role of government in all of this? So you're, you're preaching, uh, yeah. a, a, obviously, a pretty heavy theology that assumes certain moral boundaries. What is the role of government in imposing those moral boundaries? I think that Protestants have typically said, we want the role of the government to be small and to basically to leave us alone. We don't believe obviously in a theocracy, but we do believe that America, of course, was built on uh, Christian values, on the idea of the value of the individual, of the radical equality of the individual, the values of the Protestant Reformation that we saw, free inquiry, uh, being able to uh, study God's word for yourself, which of course, a lot of people say created a lot of division, but freedom always does. And so based, uh, America is based on those values and we believe that those principles are good for everyone, not just Christians, but for people of every faith. Um, so basically that's what we want. We want people to be free and we do believe, of course, that people are better bridled by religion and by morality. But it's pretty clear throughout history and throughout the Bible that theocracies 
don't work very well. Um, and I think that's probably where a lot of evangelical Christians land. It does get muddy when you talk to evangelicals about gay marriage and when you talk to them about things like that, it's like, it's really hard to vote against your own personal values if you feel like you need to vote against your own personal values. But ultimately, I do think that most evangelical Christians just want the government to leave us alone and to protect our liberty. So where do you stand on the, the governmentally imposed standard of marriage? Well, I think like a lot of Christians and maybe just a lot of people of faith in general, I wasn't excited about the Obergefell decision. I mean, the thought is, is that God created marriage and he created marriage between a man and a woman, end of story. But when you realize that, okay, well, the government's decision, they don't follow God's standards for things necessarily. They don't follow God's definitions of things necessarily. And so if they're going to have a separate definition of marriage than what God says, that's fine, but leave the churches alone. If we believe that God defined marriage, then we should be able to say whether or not, uh, you know, we want to marry two men or marry two women. And of course, that's protected for now. Um, and I think that's where most people have graduated to. I think Back in 2015, Obergefell, I think, happened. I think a lot of people were upset. I mean, we thought that it was going to be the complete downfall of the country. And more people now are like, okay, just just leave our communities of faith alone and let us make these decisions. My great worry is that it won't be left alone, is that Obergefell yeah. will be used by the state governments to cram down their viewpoints on churches and synagogues and, right. and religiously owned businesses. I think we're already beginning to see the gang of that. Right. Yeah, I agree with you because they said that, well, this is a right of, of all people. And if it's a right of all people, well, then are churches allowed to deny that? I don't know. Okay, so I do have one final question for you. I want to ask what your greatest worry is for your baby because your baby's going to be coming soon with, with the hope of God. Yeah. So I'll ask you about that in one second. First, if you want to hear Ali Stuckey's answer, you have to be a Daily Wire subscriber. Subscribe, head on over to dailywire.com, click subscribe, and you can hear the end of our conversation over there. Well, Ali Stuckey of Blaze TV, thanks so much for stopping by. Thank really appreciate you. it. And good yeah, luck with the baby. Me. Thank <laughs> you very much. The Ben Shapiro Show Sunday Special is produced by Jonathan Hay. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Associate producer, Mathis Glover. Edited by Donovan Fowler. Audio is mixed by Dylan Case. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Olvera. Title graphics by Cynthia Angulo. The Ben Shapiro Show Sunday Special is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019.